Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. Today we're going to be talking about half-lives and we're going to be talking about nuclear chemistry and we're going to be talking about using a first-order integrated rate law on a nuclear reaction. So let's talk about this for a minute. Okay, so nickel 63 has a half-life of 100 years. How long will it take to decay 62% of or 62% of the nickel 63? First off, let's ask ourselves how does nickel 63 decay? Well, that is based off of the probability of decay of this particular isotope. All right, so what we need to do is we need to pull out our awesome periodic table. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, yeah, I love, I love periodic tables. I hardly ever have one around unless it's part of an exam. So this one has constants on the opposite side of it. Okay, look at it, nickel. Nickel has an atomic number of 28. Okay, so the way we figure out if something decays, or how it decays, I should say, how, how do we predict decay? There's kind of three major rules. The first rule is to predict decay. You're gonna have kind of three biggies, right? The atomic number is greater than 83. Really, bismuth is about the end of the stable isotopes um, or the stable atoms. So if the atomic number, which we label as Z, right? So Z equals the atomic number, just to remind you. And A equals the atomic mass. And really what we should say here is we shouldn't just say atomic mass, we should say isotopic mass because this is the number of neutrons plus the number of protons. Atomic number is just the number of protons and we'll talk about as the number of neutrons. All right, so this is just a side moment. To predict decay, you want a Z greater than 83, then it's gonna alpha decay. So pretty much a huge portion of the periodic table, look at this sucker. All of these, woo, all of those decay throughout the decay, pretty much. Okay, um, then you have to do N to Z ratios. The N to Z ratio, so the number of neutrons versus the number of protons, actually tells us a huge amount ab about stability. So if the N to Z ratio is greater than one for Z, so here's kind of the idea. It's one for if Z is between about one and 20, one through 20, um, or it's greater than the band of stability, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about bands of stabilities. So that's 20 plus. The band of stability, by the way, only goes to about an end to Z ratio of 1.5. At about lead, it's about 1.5. So it's not a huge ratio. You can kind of parse it out on the periodic table. So that's if uh, 20 plus for Z. Then um, you are basically top heavy. What that means is you have more neutrons than you have protons. And if you have more neutrons than you have protons, it's usually going to undergo a beta decay. Right? If you have the exact opposite, the n to z ratio is less than one, then you have more protons than you do neutrons, and it's gonna undergo a positron emission. Or an electron capture. Both of which accomplish the same thing. Okay, so uh, realize that positron emissions and electron captures basically do the exact same thing um, in terms of changing what is essentially does is it changes a proton into a neutron. And a beta decay essentially changes a neutron into a proton. It's kind of a cool, cool idea, okay? More on this later. We'll talk about that in another video. But just in terms of thinking about it, right? So just as a reminder, if we take the difference between these two, right? 63 minus 28. Oh, math early in the morning. Yay! Without my, I'm not even going to use my calculator for this one. 13 minus 8 is 5, right? 
and then five minus two, 35, is that right? See if that, bit. yep, that works. Awesome. Okay, so that's 35 neutrons. Neutrons. Okay. We would expect at about nickel 28, uh, at the 20, at Z equal to 28, it's not gonna be exactly one. The band of stability isn't gonna have an end to Z ratio of exactly one. But it's not gonna be that far off of one. It's gonna be about maybe 1.2. Okay, so if I put the number of neutrons, n to z ratio, the number of neutrons over the number of protons here, 1.2 probably is actually big, since it's not that far off of 20. Maybe it'd be more like 1.1. Let's say it's 1, <laughs> for all intents and purposes. This is 1.25. Okay, so this is more like 1.3. So, because that's the n to z ratio here is definitely larger than the band of stability. It just is. And you can double check this. You can look in your book. Every book has a band of stability. And you could actually look at where exactly it is. Um, but 1.3 is more towards where like um, 10 or even to xenon would really be. So it's a little bit before it's time. Okay, so it's greater than the band of stability. We know it's gonna undergo a beta decay. Beta decay. What does a beta particle look like? Well, decay means that it comes off as a product. And a beta particle is basically, oh, that's a horrible beta. You're gonna forgive me for that beta. Actually, I'm gonna erase it and draw it better. What a beta particle is, is it's a high-speed electron. Okay. Okay, so what does this mean? Sorry, I'm writing and then I'm talking about it. <laughs> Sometimes I can't write and talk at the same time especially early in the morning. All right, so beta decay, high-speed electron comes off as a product. So if this is gonna come off as a product, and we know that we started off with nickel 28, then what we can say is we could balance this, and how we balance nuclear reactions is we add the two, tops, the two atomic masses, or isotopic masses, maybe more appropriately, together, and that should equal the other side. So what I'm saying, is if 63 is the only one on this side, 63 equals zero plus what? What number? And that's 63, right? And then on this side, we know we do that for the tops and we do that for the bottoms, so the atomic numbers as well. 28 equals negative one plus some number. Okay, what is that number? Well, that number is, if I wanna solve for the question mark, which we could just as easily label X if we wanted to, then if I move this to the opposite side, that's equal to 29, right? So now that I have those two numbers, I look up on the periodic table what element comes at atomic number 29, and that's copper. Pretty cool, huh? Cool. All right, so in this case, you're starting to see that we have, so really what I have now is I have the number of n's is 34 and the number of Z, the Z number is 29. So I effectively changed a neutron into a proton. Okay, all of that is extra information. <laughs> it's not actually information that we need to solve this problem, but it's interesting information. And it's one of the things that we can get from a nuclear reaction. So we know that this reaction undergoes, or this particular isotope undergoes beta decay. It's kind of fun, right? Okay. Now to answer this exact question. To answer this exact question, what you would need is you would need to know that this nickel isotope is gonna undergo, because it's a nuclear reaction, it's gonna undergo a first order reaction. And because it's gonna undergo a first order reaction, it's going to obey the first order integrated rate law. All right, so having said that, when it obeys this first order integrated rate law, what is that gonna look like for us? What that's gonna look like is based off of 
the intro video, we know what that graph looks like, which is fabulous. Sometimes this is a little more wet than others. Sorry, it might take me a minute to erase my glass. Woo! All right. So when we talk about the decay rate, we could talk about the decay rate. That would be given to us by a, a constant. Uh, we would be able to talk about that in terms of um, really simplified equations with activities and the number of nuclides. But we want to talk about how much time it takes. OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, since this is a first order, this is bound by a first order integrated rate law, what we're going to know is what that first order integrated rate law is. Right? And that first order integrated rate law is the natural log of A over time is equal to negative K times time plus the natural log of A at the beginning. Okay. So, what this will be is I need to figure out, since I'm going to be solving for t here, right, then what I could do is I could move the natural log of a at the beginning over to the opposite side. I do that by subtracting it from both sides. Okay, remember you can combine these if it's a subtraction. You can, and they're both natural logs, you can combine this into a quotient, right? So the natural log of A over time is equal to, or over, sorry, the natural log of A over time versus A at the beginning is equal to negative KT. And then I can divide everything by negative K. Or if you wanted to, you could have flipped these two and had a positive K. Either way works, okay? So our equation that we're gonna be using is going to be, I'm going to write that over here, t equals natural log of a over time versus a at the beginning. Whoopsie, that didn't work out. <laughs> My handy dandy cloth. So awesome, so good. Hey, there you go. That looks a little better. Divided by a negative k. Okay, that's going to be equ the equation I use. And that's often how this equation is given in your book, which doesn't match at all for most people why this is the equation of the line of the graph that I gave you in the intro part. It's just an anomaly. Okay, so in that case, we're going to put our periodic table away. What I'm going to do is I need to find k. Remember that k I can find through the half-life equation. t1 half equals natural log of 2 over k, so k has to be equal to the natural log of 2 over t1 half, which is going to be the natural log of 2 divided by 100 years. Woo! That's going to be fun. 100 years like that. And then we need to figure out what our amount over time is versus the amount at the beginning, right? So what we're assuming here is we're assuming that we had uh, over time, we're decaying 62% of this, right? So if we're decaying 62% of this, uh, lovely isotope, then the question is, if we decay that much, how much is left in the end? And how much did we have to begin with, right? So how much did we have to begin with? Well, we're going to have to assume that we had 100% of this stuff at the beginning, right? So this is going to be my concentration of A at the beginning. Okay, that works. If I decay 62% of it, does that mean I have 62% of it left? Or does that mean that I have basically made 62% of the nickel into now copper from our previous equation? Well, when you decay that much, that means you've basically made that go away into the next nuclide, which is what we would call the copper. And so therefore, how much do you have left you have 38% left. And that would be my A over time, okay? So when I'm doing this, what I could do is do the, let's do the natural log of two 
divided by 100. And that's going to give me a number like 0 0.00693 inverse years. Right? Yeah, that's my K. Okay. And it's years inverse because the years are on the bottom. Okay. And if I'm plugging it into this lovely equation that I wrote over there, T is equal to natural log. Okay, so what is the A over time? It's 38. What is the A at the beginning? 100%. Let's use percents here because the percents will cancel out. Okay. And then I need the negative K, which is 0 0.00693 inverse years. And you see that inverse years are in the denominator. So therefore, you're going to have to denominate. You're going to basically years are in the denominator of the denominator which puts them in the numerator. Okay, that touch on stuff. All right, so natural log of 38 divided by 100 divided by negative 0 0.00693. And that is going to be a heck of a long time. That's uh, 139. How many semen cubes years should I have here? Maybe two. So 1.4 times 10 to the second, essentially 140 years. So if I wanted to put that in scientific notation to really show the awesomeness of my significant figures, there you go. <laughs> that's not a long, that's not a long time, 104 years, it's fine. All right, until I see you next time, if I do do.